Welcome to AQA A2 Spectroscopy Lesson 3, Part A. This is the introduction to NMR. The textbook pages that you might need to look at are 142, 143 and page 147. The lesson objectives for this lesson are to understand that nuclear magnetic resonance gives information about the position of carbon-13 or proton atoms in the molecule, know the use of the delta scale for recording chemical shift, Understand that chemical shift depends on the molecular environment. Understand why tetramethylsilane, or shortened to TMS, is used as a standard. And understand that NMR spectra are obtained using samples dissolved in proton-free solvents. So the question you should all be asking right now is what is NMR? So NMR stands for Nuclear Magnetic Resonance, and it's a technique that we used to try and find out the structure of a molecule. By itself, it can't always tell you for definite that you've, at, that you've definitely got the molecule that you've predicted. But if you use it with other techniques, such as mass spectroscopy, which we've already talked about, and elemental analysis, which can tell you the percentage of each element in the compound, it can be used to pretty much definitely say what the structure of a molecule is. There are two main sorts of NMR that we're going to talk about at A-level, which is proton and carbon. There are other elements that you can do NMR with, but we don't need to worry about that at A level. Now the next few slides are going to talk about how NMR spectra are produced. And you don't need to worry about too much about this because you're not going to be asked an exam question on it. It's just that for some people it does help if you can understand where the spectra is coming from because then it helps you think about what happens in the actual spectra. Um, it does delve into the world of physics, so don't worry too much if your brain explodes on the next few slides. We'll, um, you just have to worry about the actual interpreting the spectra and predicting the spectra. So, if we just delve into the land of physics for a little bit, atoms have a property called spin angular momentum. And this can have certain values. You don't need to worry about how you work those values out. You just need to know that they can be certain values. So they can be 0, half, 1, 3 over 2, 2, 5, 2, etc. And that value is determined by the number of unpaired protons and neutrons in the nucleus of an atom. And if you've got if that value has a half in it, so half, 3 over 2, 5 over 2, then that means you can get an NMR spectra from that atom. This table shows the common nuclei that, um, and their, their spin. So if you can see 0, um, carbon 12 and oxygen 16 have got a spin of 0, which means that you don't see an NMR spectrum for them. However, in the half, you can see proton, uh, which is 1H, Carbon 13, nitrogen 15, fluorine 19, silicon 29, 31 phosphorus. So all of those have got a spin of a half, so they give the same sort of spectra. The ones at two, so um, so you've got deuterium there and normal nitrogen, and the one at three, which is 10 boron, you won't see a spectra for those. The ones with a spin of three over two or five over two um, are listed there if you want to see them. Um, they give very complicated NMR spectra, so you don't have to worry about those. In fact, we're only going to talk about the carbon and the hydrogen. So atoms behave a little bit like magnets. So you can have two ways they can align, just like you have north and south with two magnets. So you can have the atoms aligned together with each other or opposite to each other. So if you have an external magnetic field, the atom can either be aligned with the field or against the field. Now if it's aligned with the field, then that's energetically more favourable, it's a lower energy. However, if it's lined against the magnetic field, then that's higher energy because it's going against the external magnetic field. If you put a little bit of energy in there that's, that's equivalent to the gap in energy between aligned and not aligned, then you can get the non-aligned atom to flip so that it's aligned with the magnetic field. However, it will then flip back again and it will give out the energy that you put in in the first place. And this energy can be measured, and that's what gives an NMR spectra. So this slide just shows diagrammatically um, what I was just talking about. That you've got your external magnetic field represented by that green arrow, and the energy, you've got the, just like an energy profile diagram, you've got the, the bottom nucleus, you've got a carbon-13 nucleus which is aligned with the external magnetic field and that's a lower energy because it's going in the same direction shown here by the arrows going in the same direction. But the higher line 
is then then has the nucleus going downwards, so it's opposed to the external magnetic field. So that you can see from that energy diagram, there's a gap between those two um, possibilities, and that corresponds to a certain amount of energy. So if you put that certain amount of energy in, you can get that carbon-13 nucleus to flip and be aligned against the field. But then it will then give out that energy again, and that's what we measure. And this is this process is the resonance that happens, which is why we call it nuclear magnetic resonance. So here we come to the bit that interests us as chemists, rather than physics. And that's what affects the magnetic field. So the strength of the field felt by each nucleus in the molecule is affected by two factors. Now the first one is going to be the same if you're using the same NMR machine, set up in the same way. And that's the strength of the field. So that's the external field we're talking about, the one generated by the NMR machine. So that's going to be the same for every NMR sample and every atom in, in, the, in that molecule of the NMR sample that is in the NMR machine. So that's not going to change. What is going to change is the electron density around, e, around each individual atom. Because, as it says there, part B, shielding generated by a weak magnetic field generated by the electrons surrounding the nucleus. So the electrons around a nucleus generate a weak magnetic field, and that's very weak compared to the magnet in the NMR machine but it still is a factor. And each individual atom in a molecule is going to have a slightly different electron density around the nucleus, so it's going to have a slightly different mag magnetic field generated by those electrons. And that's what gives us the NMR spectra, and that's what gives us the information that's so useful, because the NMR spectra tells us about the electron density around the nuclei. So here's an example of an NMR spectra. Now, normally it wouldn't have those round circles on there that coloured in. That's just to show that we can match up the spectra with the molecule that's drawn at the bottom. So that molecule at the bottom is a molecule that this is the NMR spectra of. So you can see some general features on there. It's actually in a, a proton NMR spectra, but that doesn't matter at this point. I just want to show you the general features. So you can see here that it says PPM. So that's what the, the um, horizontal axis is recorded in, and that's parts per million. And that's the units of the chemical shift which is represented by this delta symbol. And this arrow here shows that the shielding increases as you go to the right. So on the left, over here, this one that's about 11, that's, we've marked it in red, and the reason we've marked it in red is that it's this hydrogen here which is attached to an oxygen. Now, as you know, oxygen is very electronegative, and so it's withdrawing electron density from the hydrogen, which is what we call deshielding. So because it's deshielded, it comes to the left of the spectrum, whereas this hydrogen here, which is represented by the green blob, that's these two hydrogens here, and they're equivalent hydrogens, but you don't need to worry about that at the moment. But because they're not right next to an oxygen, they're not as deshielded as the one in red. So that comes further to the right of the spectrum. So here you can see a carbon-13 NMR, and as you can see it's a bit more simple than the one that I showed you before. You've only got three peaks because you've only got three carbons, whereas on the previous one you had more hydrogens, more protons, so it's a bit more complicated. But the same principle applies. This, you can see that the scale is the same as it was on the previous one, so it's still measured in ppm there. And it's still, the shielding increases as you go to the right. So the atoms that are shielded will be on the right-hand side, whereas the atoms that are deshielded will be on the left-hand side. So you can see this one marked by this orange circle here. That's this carbon here, which has got not one but two oxygens next to it. And this carbonyl and this other oxygen here of the OH is very electron withdrawing. So that orange carbon is is has less electron density around it than the green one, which is down here. So that's why the signal comes on the left hand side of the spectra. So in this slide we're going to talk about TMS, which is a standard. Now TMS stands for tetramethyl silane, which is this um, molecule that is drawn on the right hand side. And TMS is a very useful molecule, and that's what we use 
for our standard. Now the reason we need a standard is so that we can put that into our NMR sample and we can compare our NMR peaks to, to the standard because if we don't have a standard in there we can't say for definite where our peaks are occurring. So the only reason we have this scale is, the only reason I can say that that is 4 is because I've put some TMS in my sample and therefore I know that that is where 0 is. So the reason why we use TMS I think there's a few reasons, and this is a very popular exam question, so you do need to learn these. Well, first of all, it's chemically unreactive, so it's not going to react with your sample. Because the last thing you want after you've made your um, carefully prepared compound that you've spent weeks and weeks making, the last thing you want to do is put it in an NMR tube and then destroy it because it's then reactive with your uh, standard. Secondly, it's got 12 equivalent protons and one carbon environment. So if you look at this molecule here, there are... 3, 6, 9, there's 12 hydrogens there, but they're all equivalent. And we haven't talked about what that means, but we will in a later video, so don't worry about that too much. But all it means is that you'll only get one peak. So on both proton NMR and carbon-13 NMR, you'll only get one peak, and it'll be very sharp, and it'll be very strong. The third reason is that the nuclei in TMS are heavily shielded, so what that means is that there's rarely any peaks to the right-hand side of it. So unless you're doing some uh, transition metal chemistry, then all the peaks that you'll see in your molecule will be to the left of TMS. And that makes it nice and easy to see your spectra. Fourthly, it's volatile, which means it evaporates easily. And that's really important because after you've um, run your NMR spectra, you quite often want to get your molecule back from it. You want your sample of your chemical back so that you can do something else with it. And lastly, it's non-toxic. Because if you're using something very frequently and you're using it in the lab, it's important that it's not going to kill you. So that's enough about the actual spectra until you watch the next video. There's a quick word about solvents. So NMR is normally carried out in solution. But this gives us a problem because most solvents are organic and therefore they've got both carbon and hydrogen. And these would obviously give peaks. And because there's much more of the solution than there is of your sample, they'd swamp it and you'd see a very nice NMR spectra for the solvent but you wouldn't be able to see your sample, which is obviously what you're interested in. So to solve this, we use deuterated solvents, and they're used instead. And deut deuterium is um, hydrogen, but it's hydrogen too. So it's got an extra neutron, so it's an isotope of hydrogen. And as we saw earlier on in the slides, that doesn't have a spin of a half. So therefore, you don't get an NMR signal. Um, it, this isn't a problem for carbon-13 because the solvent um, signal peaks for carbon-13 are easily recognised and can be removed by computer software. So it's only a problem for the NMR, proton NMR. So last slide here, just the lesson objectives again. So just make sure that you read over these and make sure that you've understood everything here. If not, watch the video again or read the textbook, whatever you need to do to make sure you understand it.